Good day, and welcome back to chemistry videos. I was having a little tea there. It was good. Um, so what we're doing today is we're doing alkene additions. And the alkene additions that we're going to do are basic alkene additions. In, not included in these, but certainly could be included in these. Um, you have things like oxidations and reductions. So reductions would be adding H to some kind of alkene and oxidations would be something like adding O's or halogens to um, an alkene. Sometimes those are specified in their own classes, so epoxidation and ozonolysis are both um, considered oxidations. Um, sometimes they're included in the midst of our general chapter on alkene additions. And so several of these, for instance, are al actually oxidations, and that's totally fine, <laughs> but that is kind of the differentiation between these. So I'm not going to do any reductions. Um, we'll do that in a separate video, and I'm not going to do epoxidation and ozonolysis. So for those of you who already know what that is, good for you. We're not doing those. All right, so in terms of alkene additions, we can add several things to an alkene. I just talked about a whole bunch of stuff we could add to an alkene. Remember that an alkene has the general look of a double bond between two C's, and what I add to the either side of those C's, you know, can vary wildly. Okay, so I'm adding an R on one side. I'm making this an asymmetrical or an unsymmetrical um, alkene, and I like doing that. Um, the R group would have would be some kind of carbon chain that's then bonded to it. Okay, so this is since this has H's on one side, this would be a terminal alkene. We can add a lot of things. Each of these have, has its own name. I don't care, tend to care about the names as much, but there you go. So we could add HX. HX um, X is not actually found on the periodic table. X in organic chemistry is a general way of talking about um, Cl, Br, I, so on and so forth. Um, halides are Xs, so that's kind of the sense. So halides are Xs with usually the exception of F. F is not a great X um, in organic chemistry because it's too reactive. Okay, so HXs, Xs are usually gonna be CLs and BRs, sometimes Is. In this particular case, you have Is as well. And um, this is called a hydrohalogenation because you're adding H on one side, which is the hydro. You're adding the X on the other side, that's the halogenation. Hydration reactions would have an addition of water. So you're going to add an alcohol to one side and an H to the other. Um, they have to be done in the midst of an acid catalyst. The acid catalyst here, for the vast majority of the time, is sulfuric acid. Because sulfuric acid makes an awesome acid catalyst. Halogenation, adding Br um, to each side of the alkene or CL. Um, you cannot use I here, it's too big, so uh, often it will be abbreviated as X2, and that really means just two of those um, halogens and that CL, CL and BR. Hydro, uh, wait, I already did a hydrohalogenation, sorry, a halohydration names just flipped. It's not that different, but it tells you what's attacking first, which is really interesting. In a hydrohalogenation, the H adds first, which is why it comes first in the name. Halohydration, in this case, the Br, or the Cl, adds first. So that is why it has preference in the name, or priority in the name. Hydration part would be an OH from the water. Hydroboration oxidation, this one is the most unique of all of them in that it has um, anti-Markovnikov properties. And the reason why it does that is because the BH3 forms uh, a specific kind of intermediate that's interesting and different than the intermediates that are formed for these other ones. Okay. In terms of intermediates, by the way, it often helps to make a chart like this, and it often helps to get a sense of what does Markovnikov addition, what forms, what adds anti versus sin versus both, um, and what kind of intermediates are formed. In terms of these, let me do a different color here. These two are going to have carbo. Oh, can you see that? Oh, not if I go that high. Sorry. 
I'm going a little crazy. I apologize. Carbo cation. I should write that in a different. Sorry. Sorry. Sometimes I go a little crazy at the top of the board here. Or at top of the glass, I should say. These two first these first two reactions have what we call a carbocation intermediate. I'll write it right here. Ooh, that's right. Carbocation intermediate, which means that the, it's going to form a plus on one of the carbons. Here, these two have what we call a bridged holonium ion. Intermediate. And this one has such a weird intermediate that we don't even call it a name most of the time. <laughs> or at least I don't know what the name is. Okay. So in terms of doing these, what we're going to do today is we're going to do I think I've already done a hydrohalogenation reaction and shown you the mechanism for that. We're going to do the halogen, uh, halogenation reaction and do a mechanism for that. Okay, so let's erase all of this. Hopefully you got it. Or you can pause it and we'll talk about what Markovnikov addition means and all of that stuff. So those of you who are like, I don't know what she wrote on half of the board or half of the glass just there, you will you will get knowledge oh so soon, as soon as this is cleared off. Okay. All right. Woohoo! You can always tell a teacher by the fact that they love office supplies and really clean boards. That's how it goes. All right, so in terms of this, shall we designate what R is? Sure. If we were in the classroom right now, I would ask my students to pick their poison in terms of R. All right, what R is calling to you these days? <laughs> Since we're not in the classroom, in a formal setting where I have students in front of me. I'm just gonna pick the R. Here we go. I'm gonna say it's um, ethyl, methyl. I think methyl is probably the easiest to work with, so let's just do methyl. It makes me happy. All right, so in this case, what we're gonna be adding is we're gonna be adding Br2. If we add Br2 to the reaction, um, or to the reaction um, mixture, usually we, add a solvent as well. Solvent considerations are much more prominent in SN1, SN2, E1, and E2 reactions. Um, so if you just see something else like CCL4 or something along those lines here, it's or THF, that's just a solvent. Um, it's not part of the actual reaction mechanism that you have to know. Okay, so having said that, let's take this Br2 and let's actually react it. Let's do something that's a different color here. All right, so my Br2, which is a nonpolar molecule. Okay, its polarity is, uh, it ha doesn't have a dipole moment. It has, it's nonpolar because those are the exact same electronegativity for each of the Br's on either side of that covalent bond. Um, so it's a really interesting mechanism that's going to happen here because as the Br2 comes close to the alkene, it in, the alkene induces a dipole. And the dipole is induced um, in the Br that's closest to the alkene, and then the other Br takes the opposite sign. Um, what that dipole looks like is, I'm doing it in partial plus and partial minus. You could just as well do it with the arrows, right? So we know that dipoles tend to point towards what's more electronegative and uh, put a plus on the side that's more of a plus. I'm not drawing a true dipole. Uh, I didn't want to dr draw a true dipole moment here because it's an induced dipole. It's not a huge difference between these two. Um, and it's temporary, so, you know, I'm going to erase that 
because I don't like the dipole moment very much, but if you do, go with it. Okay. All right, so what happens here? That alkene is going to be our nucleophile. What's awesome about all alkene additions and alkyne additions, actually, is that the alkene or the alkyne, the pi electrons in that double or triple bond act as the nucleophile. That's just an easy, easy pickings right there. Okay. The electrophile has to be on the opposite um, molecule being used here, so on the other reactant. So you need to make a choice between those BRs. I would choose the one that is the partial plus is an electrophile needs to be, um, is the equivalent of a Lewis acid, which means that it is electron deficient. Okay, it might be temporarily electron deficient, but that's what we're saying. Okay, nucleophile, by the way, is the equivalent of Lewis base, which means that it is um, electron, uh, it's an electron donor, more or less. Electron donor, by the way, most of the, of the time means that it has a lone pair or pi electrons. Okay, nucleophile always attacks electrophile. So there you go. You're not going to make two bonds to that BR um, in terms of to the C's, right? So usually what happens here is when the pi bonds attack the BR, then the electrons in the covalent bond go on to the other BR, which is exactly what happens here. What's really interesting in this particular case is that the BR, the electrophile that's being attacked, that BR, also has lone pairs and therefore has nucleophilic properties. It becomes very confusing, I know, but this is where the weirdness comes in. So, in that case, those lone pairs are going to attack this C on the opposite side. Lots going on. So more or less, the covalent bond is broken. The electrophile is the only thing that's attaching, but it's attaching twice to both carbons. And here's what we get. Actually, I should move that a little bit down, more like this. Oy. Let me move that other H down, and I'm going to move it. I'm going to move both of these down. There you go. Ooh. You get what we call the bridged polonium ion. Okay, so the BR is here. Um, there's my two lone pairs on the BR, and it's going to form a bond here and a bond here. That is weird, guys. That is weird. If I have these two as lines in the plane, notice that all of these, I need some dimensionality here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this one comes out towards you. This one goes away from you. That one goes away from you. And that one comes out towards you. OK. The bridge telonium ion. OK, and then you have this other BR plus a BR minus hanging out. OK. And that's, that plus means in addition to this bridge telonium ion molecule. But I'm going to erase, actually, the plus so that you guys don't get confused that somehow the BR has a plus on one side and a minus on the other. That's just not, it's, <laughs> that's just not what's happening here. OK. So now that I have this bridge telonium ion, this is just one of the uh, weirdest intermediates. Notice that BR has more than one um, bond around it. And we know BR likes to only form one bond. So this is actually a plus, where, which is where the bridge telonium ion comes in, right? And what's interesting here is that you look at this and you should immediately recognize that if nothing else, this is a triangle. It's a triangle intermediate that's formed. The triangle intermediate is not a stable intermediate. It does not like to exist as such. And so therefore, it has some angle strain. It has some, uh, probably has other kinds of strain going on, 
okay? Um, angle strain is the most prominent in triangular intermediates. And then you have, basically, that's the first thing you should notice. The second thing you should notice is that I've entirely locked up this side of the, the top of this alkene, right? So what used to be the alkene is gone. This bridge telonium ion exists. And this entire side where the pink is, is entirely locked up. You can't attack anything on this side. Um, it just is not going to happen. OK, so having said that, you need to attack from the opposite side. So let's do that. Let's attack from the opposite side. Let's take this BR and move it down so that it's on the opposite side. There we go. How about that? OK. So where is this going to attack? OK. You can either just know that um, you are going to attack the, the first BR is going to add to the side that is less substituted, and the second BR that attacks would form on or would attack on the more substituted side. You could also say that because this is a plus, right, then I start to have some um, difference between these two carbons. And the more substituted side tends to take more of a partial positive kind of nature about it. Not perfect, because a plus and a plus, we don't, those don't like each other. And this side is going to have more of a partial negative side. Why does the partial positive side form on the more substituted side? Simply because it's more stable there, right? So if you have to assign some polarity to these, then you want to assign the positive one to the side that's more substituted. OK. Let's do a little bit of attacking here. This is my nucleophile now. My electrophile is going to be that C. Those electrons are going to attack. When those electrons attack, um, I'm going to form a bond between the BR and the C. At this point, you should recognize that C cannot have five bonds around it. So that means that covalent bond, that single bond, has to be cut and put back on to the BR, which is going to do two things, right? It's going to eliminate my problem of five bonds around C, and it's going to put a lone pair back on the BR, which will eliminate the plus. OK, so then I get C. Um, these two are going to be moved up, right? So let's do it like this. Here's my BR that I just attached. Let's um, move these two up. And I'm not going to show the stereochemistry of those two, although I certainly could. This one could certainly still be out towards you, and that one could be back. That's totally fine. Um, and then I have my bond to my other C. And here's my uh, C that I began with on this side. And I'm going to do my two H's, kind of the same way that I did before, but without the wedges and the uh, dotted line. And here's my original BR that I had on there. OK. All right, now, what's going on here in terms of chemi organic chemist's language, right? We have um, the idea of two different nucleophilic attacks. The first nucleophilic attack is with the alkene and the BR. OK, I formed the bridge telonium ion. And that has steric strain on the top part. I don't know if I said steric strain at that point. Sorry if I didn't. Steric strain is basically the idea. It has ring strain from the triangle, but it has steric strain because it's locked up that side. So you couldn't possibly get something in to make it react. So it has to attack from the opposite side. And so that second nucleophilic attack is on the opposite side of the bridge telonium ion, leaving us with what we call an anti-addition anti-addition. OK, 
Okay, the anti-addition is of the BRs. If I wanted to keep my lovely stereochemistry here, I certainly could. That's totally fine, okay? But you're just moving it up, okay? But the BRs have to be opposite one another, and that's simply because of the bridge telonium ion. How many steps does this, does this take? It takes two steps, two nucleophilic attacks to get to the end. That means that if I had an, uh, an energy diagram for this, right? Here's my delta E. Here's the reaction as it progresses. Here's my reactants. Here's my products. I'm assuming always that my products are lower energy in the end than my reactants. Then if it's a two-step process, we would expect for two humps, okay, and two transition states. There's transition state one, transition state two, and notice that the difference in the activation energies should be different between transition state one, right? And this is the intermediate. The intermediate is this little line right here. And that is the intermediate between that second transition state is a much smaller activation energy. The intermediate in this case is the bridge telonium ion, okay? I would expect the first step to be rate limiting. How would I expect it, the first step is rate limiting? It has a much bigger activation energy, folks. So because it has a much bigger activation energy, it should require more, remember this is like a roller coaster. Once you get up to the top of the roller coaster, it just goes. There are very, there are reactions that have an activation energy that is rather large, that is in the middle of the, the reaction. Um, and that is, that happens, but it's less prominent, at least in organic chemistry. All right, so that's kind of a sense of what's all of the things that are going on in this reaction. We could talk about the Hammond postulate and such, um, that the Hammond postulate just says that um, your reaction, your final product um, versus your reactants, when you look at the transition state, if you had like a one-step reaction, the transition state is gonna look more like the uh, reactants or the products whatever stage, we'll call these two the stages, the transition state is going to look more like the stage that it's closest in energy to. So for instance here, the way I've drawn this, the, um, the transition state is closer to the reactants than it is to, the, or at least transition state one is closer to the reactants in energy than it is to the products. Look at that, that's a big old change in energy. So therefore, in this particular reaction, transition state one should look more like the reactants, okay? So that's kind of a sense of what's going on here. Um, any, I'm hoping that you guys have questions, and if you have questions, you'll leave them for me in some way, shape, or form, perhaps on the Pi app. Until I see you again, um, I wish you well. I do.